So um, the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, is globally the most important insect pollination service uh, in the world. I'm sure we know this already. And it, you, I'm sure you know that it's present on all the continents of the world, with the exception of the Antarctic. Uh, historically, of course, it's been on our continent and some others, and then spread to the, to the New World, to the, to the Americas and Australasia and so on, by humans. Um, and so it's present just about, just about everywhere. Um, and partly that's because it adapts easily when introduced into new ecosystems. The reason that Apis mellifera has become so successful in across different environments is become it does because it, it adapts so easily. And one of the things about creatures that adapt um, that are that are, end up in different different areas with different conditions, perhaps different predators, different different food sources, different climate conditions, and so on. They adapt to those, and over time, they develop differences from the population that they've left. And this is normal. We see this. Um, Darwin spotted it in in in, in different places. Uh, I think in the Galapagos Islands as well. Um, and there's a study that um, in 2014, it's referenced on the left here, a Buchler's study, and it's open access. So I'd encourage you to have a look at it if you're interested in this topic. It that it shows that locally adapted honeybees subspecies show a higher survival rate in their home place than the imports. And that's entirely normal, isn't it? If you think about it, if you've ever seen a Labrador in hot weather, you know that they're not really suited to hot weather. You know, they're much better suited to, to cold climates. And so the subspecies of honeybees, um, Apis mellifera, mellifera mellifera is more, is likely to be more successful in our climate than perhaps Ligustica, the Italian bee. Um, so, um, Buchler's data does not use, it doesn't study, does not use Irish data, it uses other data, but the principle is fairly, is not one that we need to challenge very much. And so there are about 32 um, different subspecies of Apis mellifera. Um, and we know that mellifera and mellifera is one, and there are others like Ligustica and so on. I think we've talked about those. We'll talk about those some more. And about a third of those are native to Europe. Um, here, here, here there, there are 11 of them, as you can see in the top here, we have Apis mellifera, which is the one that's of, of greatest interest to us. Now it's Apis mellifera mellifera, to be clear, and that's a subspecies. And that is present from the west of Ireland all the way through to the Urals here, so huge range. It's north, uh, natively anyway, of the Pyrenees and the Alps and the Caucasian mountains, so it's uh, this whole range here. You see Iberiensis in Spain and Portugal. Sicula in Sicily, Ligustica in Italy, Rutneri in um, Malta, Cipria, of course, Cyprus, Anatolica in, of course, Anatolia, uh, uh, Anatolian Turkey, uh, Cecropia in Greece, Macedonia in, uh, obviously, Macedonia and Caucasia in the Caucasian mountains. And then there are other subspecies elsewhere in the world. Now, um, If we look, so how do we tell the difference? This is the question between those different subspecies. And the one method that was developed is to actually measure specific things. I mean, I'm sure you've heard beekeepers say, oh, my bees are yellow or my bees are black and therefore they are of a certain race. It's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. Um, and and we know this. Um, the some some girls at the um, school girls at the young young scientists exhibition some years ago did a did a morphometric analysis of honeybees and found much greater genetic diversity than was expected at the time. Now, so morphometric analysis were initially used, as I say. So let's look at a couple of these important measures. And beekeepers, you can do this as well if you have a, if you're skilled with a microscope you can do this yourselves. You take 30 wings and you measure, and here is a wing here mounted on a microscope slide. And I hope you can see it here. And as you can see, these are veins. And some of these veins, and you can see there are joint junctions, joints, junctions between the veins. And the length of these, or the relative position of these varies between the different subspecies. And so what you see here is this length here, A, and this length B can be measured to, to understand the cubital ratio. Now for Apis mellifera, they are about the same length. So the ratio is about one. Um, for mellifera carnica, Apis mellifera carnica, the carniolum bee, which is of course is native to, um, to Slovenia, is 
um, it is nearer to three. It's much more. So this is a very reliable method, method for look, for seeing um, the the subspecies of your of your bees of the 30 bees that you sampled. And another measure, which is similar, is called the discoidal shift. What you do here is if you can just look at the blue for the moment, you, you draw a line here, this blue line R. Then what you do is you measure it and you bisect it. Or, so you find the midpoint and you draw a line at 90 degrees L. So you've got this T shape in blue. And then you look for this junction here of where these veins join this point x and you and you look and you, you you look whether x is to the left in this this side to the body side if you like of the wing or to the right to the other side to the wingtip side in this case you can see it's to the left and typically and you can measure the angle as well and you can see that that in this case the angle is negative and that's more likely to be apis mellifera that's discoidal shift. Now, an alternative to using the uh, morphometry, wing morphometry, is DNA, and that's only been around for a short time. It was obviously uh, the double helix of DNA was discovered by Crick and Watson and uh, Rosalind, Ros Rosalind Franklin as well. Um, and in 2006, the complete gen gen uh, genome of Apis mellifera was, was, was sequenced, was published, which means that's the map of all the genes. And now they're working their way through the subspecies to see how to get all of the, all of the data on them. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. And the genome of Apis mellifera has about 260 million DNA base pairs. That's 260 pieces of information, if you like. And you can think of those as letters on a page or numbers in a spreadsheet or something like that, or um, pieces of code in a, in a computer. Um, so they are they're pieces of data, instructions, if you like. Um, so that's, that's in the chromosomes. There's also mitochondrial DNA, which is circular DNA in, 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 um, in the cells as well. And that's in a separate place. That contains much less, only 16,000 base pairs, but it's a different, it provides different information and very interesting information. Now, you may know that humans have 46 um, chromosomes in fact 23 pairs and obviously you can um, we humans we have a set from our mother and a set from our father so 23 pairs and um and you know you know there are commercial services that are, that allow you to sequence your pair your, your own dna and to see whether you're you know a quarter french or whatever you happen to be um we have 23 um we have 46 which is two uh, uh 23 twice uh Queen honeybees and worker honeybees have 16 twice, that's 32. And drone honeybees have this strange thing where they're not deployed. They don't have a pair. They don't have pairs. They only have half of the genes. They are, they are unfertilized eggs. So they only have, a, they, they only have their mother's genes. And they, um, they are the, what's known as haploid. So they have half as many chromosomes and they don't have one from mum and one from dad. They only have one from one from mum. And if you look at a cell, this is what a, a, the cells in your body and mine look like. In the middle, this is this nucleus, this large, um, the, the largest circle is the cell. The second largest circle is the nucleus. And within the nucleus are the chromosomes, which we'll have a look at. And down, these are the mitochondria. They have a function as well. And there's mitochondrial DNA in those. So um, now, so DNA structure. Well, if you look at this slide, you can see that this slide is written in words, um, and there's a bit of um, there's some there's some uh, punctuation marks as well. So there are the 26 characters of the of the alphabet, and most of them are being used in here. Uh, not all of them. I don't think there's a Z in there, is there? Um, um, and some characters, so there are about 30 characters. DNA is encoded in four different things. There are four, um, th there are four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And these are always in pairs. So they're all, and they're always in the same pairs. A and T are always together, and C and G are always together, but they can be in either order. And so you have four permutations. 
A T, T A, C G, and G C. Again, you have four nucleotides. These are always combined in pairs, and they always pair with the same one. A and T always pair, C and G always pair. And so you, um, you have four permutations here. And if we look now at the DNA itself, and if we were zooming into your DNA or mine, it would look like this. Here are the chromosomes, of which there are 16 in honeybee, 23 of us pairs. Um, and what you can see here, and we talked about this pair, here's an AT pair, and this one is a TA pair. It's the same, but different information, but, but backwards, so different information. And these are physically in a helix, um, which of course was the great discovery of Crick Watson and Crick and Watson and uh, Rosalind Franklin. You can, there's a lot you can read about DNA structure if you're interested in this. It's a fascinating subject. Now, so what does this mean? Oh, sorry, the mitochondrial DNA is, uh, there's less, rather than 260 million pieces of information, as we said, there's about 16,000. I think we've got 16,343 16, here for apis mephra. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot more information. Again, this can be studied to understand more about the bee. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, what's the point, I suppose? Well, how does this work? Well, a triplet of pairs, so the three pairs in a row, those will code an amino acid, which create proteins, which create you and me. And so that's, they are, they are used, if you like, as the code, for the building blocks for creatures like you or me. And if you have your mother's eyes or your father's hair, um, that's how it's passed on from them to you. And of course, errors occur in replication for various reasons that are kind of interesting in itself. And they can be something be switched around, something can be deleted, something can be duplicated and something can be added. So all of that information and that creates changes um, and that ha this happens naturally all the time in nature. And that's why you get, you get new mutations in humans as well as in, as in other, um, uh, uh, other animals and plants. And that causes changes. Some of those mutations will be adaptations like giraffes having a longer neck, which are actually quite useful. Um, and so those make you more fit to survive. And if a uh, honeybee uh, clusters more tightly in winter or uh, is more frugal, it's going to survive better in a, in, a, in a rough climate. So that is the principle of how this works. So there's this random process of mutation. And then the ones that are best suited are the ones that survive. It's a very slow, long process and takes thousands and thousands of years to deliver deliver the value but it's inexorable and it's happening all the time around us and that's how natural selection works and, and there's, there's a lot more you can read about that let's look at a specific example if you look at this dna here and we look at the sixth one along what have you got six this one is g and c and what you can see here there's a mutation this has changed into t and a it's not always a switch it can be a deletion it can be a uh, copying and adding and a, a copying and a, a duplication adding another piece or it can be uh, can be a, other, other sorts of change of single or mute or multiple changes as well uh, genetic analysis are based on comparing the dna sequences which of course you can't do manually with 260 60 million people but um, with computer modeling you can do that you can computer you can read that stuff so you look for known variations um sequ the sequences poly G dna polymorphism or, or of a single nucleotide that's a single pair, uh, that's known as a SNP, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, and uh, polymorphisms are known as SNPs. Simple changes like that. And as we say, deletions, insertions, change in a bear, in a base pair, a load of text being moved around, all sorts of changes. They just occur naturally. Um, and that allows us to dig much more deeply into, into information, and not just for bees, but for all sorts of other creatures. We've understood all sorts of things. Mitochondrial DNA can be used as well as the other DNA, but in itself, it can't detect hybrids. But so you use all of the bits that you can, obviously. And with 260 million pieces of information, there's a lot of research going on all the time there's a lot of data to analyze. So, so there's lots to learn about this and that's why the science is updating itself all the time. So where does the honeybee sit in the world, in the animal kingdom? 
Well, it's an animal, right? It's an arthropod, and arthropods um, are invertebrates with particular characteristics, typically an, an exoskeleton and jointed legs and so on, arthropods. Within that, you have insects. Of course, spiders are arthropods, they have, but they have eight legs, so they're not insects, they're separate. Hymenoptera are um, membrane or gossamer wings, uh, insects that have those species, that's the order. The fa family is the apidea, which is... Um, uh, and then within that, you have the genus Apis, which is the bee itself. And then, of course, you have the species Apis mellifera. And below that, you have the subspecies, which is not shown on here, which is a AMM or AM scutellata and so on and so forth. So let's have a look at those in some more detail. Honeybees, where did you, how did we get here? Well, honeybees um, evolved relatively recently in an um, evolutionary sense, only about 100 million years ago. Um, and they started out, they evolved from what we would now call wasps, um, which were carnivorous, and they started to uh, adopt a diet of nectar and pollen, uh, particularly po pollen. And what you can see here, this is a fossil in amber. I'm sure you would have seen these. Uh, you can see the, there's quite a lot of these and you can buy them sort of commercially. Um, fossils in amber um, uh, are, allow you to, uh, is the way insects are often preserved. And the way it happens is amber, of course, is tree sap, tree resin. And what happens is the insect lands on the tree, gets stuck in the resin, gets entombed in the resin as, the, as more resin pulls out of the tree, and then it gets pressed. And then 100 million years later, it's a piece of amber. But what's interesting about these, these waspy fossils is they have hairs on the back legs, on the hind legs, to trap pollen. So they're starting to become what we look like, what look like bees. Minister effects Burman. No, it's not, that's not Apis Minifera, clearly, but there are lots of those and you can find all sorts of them on the internet. This one's from Myanmar, uh, uh, we used to call Burma, was the obvious. Now, um, let's have a look at the picture then. This is the, the phylogenic uh, um, tree. And this shows, um, this shows, that you had the wasps up here and over time over 150 million years about here they started to look at collecting pollen they started to create they started to become what we would recognizably call bees and you can see the bees is here and then they started apidea started to branch out here our kinds of bees if you like and then apis started to appear up here and you can see the broad time scale is about 50 60 70 million years ago or something like that and they became social as well so this is where they all fit together in the tree of life now within the apis species so we're down at the bottom of the tree of life onto the far right of the top the, the, sorry the top top right of that picture there there are three sorts of apis species You've got the cavity nesting bees are the ones that we know and love, uh, mellifera, but also serrana, Koschevnikov and uh, nulensis. The giant bees, um, dorsata and laboriosa, and then two that are more recently uh, have made it into the literature, bingami and uh, nogrosinchta. And then the dwarf bees, florea and andreniformis. Um, so you've got three different types of bees, um, three, dif three different groups, I suppose, of bees within that um, and if you look at the picture the tree of life the phylogenetic chart tree for them here what you can see is within the apis you've seen the dwarf ones have split off first um, years and years ago more than six million years ago and then the the giant bees and the cavity nesting bees have split off here and i'm sure you've seen the, the giant bees that um that the, if you've ever watched those videos of the lads climbing up cliffs and tr trees and so on to to get out the honey the big big sheets of comb that are in the open that's typically the boreosa desatosata and these lads um now and down here of course then we have mellifera and then the other ones have split off serana and indica and so on all cavity nesting bees there now, um, let's look at Apis mellifera itself, the subspecies. And as we said, there are about 32 sort of subspecies, but that's a big number. So these have been divided up based on studies, and there is more work ongoing in this area, so it can change. Um, as we said, there were 32. Uh, one study says 33, generally it's thought of as 32. 
but but it is changing and I, I did my senior exams in 2005 and a lot of this data has been this has been updated since so if you're reading up on this it's really important to read the most modern stuff and not, not um, and actually the academic stuff obviously is is ahead of the beekeeping textbooks i'm going to get to another example of that shortly but apis mellifera the subspecies are broadly defined in four four lineages a for africa um scutellata which i'm sure you know has become the killer bees in america um, or certainly hybridized into, they were brought to, to uh, Latin America. And also Apis mellifera capensis, which is a fascinating little creature, as I'm, uh, perhaps you know already, just what it, um, it has that uh, 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 characteristic of Thelitoki, which you can look up. Apis mellifera capensis from the Cape of uh, the bottom of South Africa. The O lineage, lineage um, is Eastern European sub uh, species and the Middle East. So, uh, Coca Caucasica, the sea lineage, southern and eastern one, so Carnica, uh, the, Car the Carniolan bee, or the Slovenian bee, uh, and Ligustica, which of course is um, uh, Italian. And then the M lineages, that we're, we're most interested in, which is Mellifera mellifera, which is ours, and Mellifera iberiensis, which, as I'm sure you will guess, is from the Iberian Peninsula. I say from because where they're from, this is where they were. Um, uh, where they are, where they were originate, uh, where they are originally from, but of course humans have moved them around, so, so they're not all uh, confined to these spaces anymore. Before the development of genetic analysis of honeybees, um, already before we had the genetics, we already had these four lineages um, because they can they could see the similarities based on based on morphometry. Which is kind of interesting and now with the genetic analysis there are four this is supported and um, however there's a lot of data and a lot of people and a lot of a lot of people doing this research and there are two potentially new additional lineages which i won't go into detail the y and the s lineages and new papers are being published all the time um which challenge old ways of thinking and so what you see, what you may see in in a short time or a long time, is uh, those those four lineages being 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 challenged and other stuff, other 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 models being adopted, and that's just the nature of science, isn't it? So, as I said, Apis mel has its four lineages in these four places. Broadly speaking, A in Africa, M north of the Pyrenees. Um, um, sorry, M M is in Iberia and north of, north of the Alps. C is uh, Italy and so on and so forth, and uh, and Slovenia, and O is east of there, the Carpathian, uh, Car the Caucasian mountains, and so on. Very broadly speaking. Um, now, when I did my senior exams back in two thousand and five, it was it was in the books, and it was it was known that bees came from Africa. This is no longer believed to be the case. So it's a really good example of how the science has made some of the information in our beekeeping textbooks and some of the beekeeping information that senior people will tell you in good faith is no longer supported by current evidence. And that's a real challenge when you're trying to um, uh, show uh, knowledge in these areas. So um, Apis mellifera may have its origin in Northern Africa, not tropical Africa, as, as was once thought, or in what we sometimes call the Near East, so the Arabian Peninsula, um, the, the places like Lebanon and so on. And it may have expanded into Europe across the Strait of Gibraltar or through Turkey. Now, the nine other species of Apis are all found exclusively in Asia. And so that, in, that, that one of the things that you could, you could imply from that is that Apis mellifera may have its origin in Asia as well and have expanded to the rest of the, to Africa and Europe from there and I say more information is more 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 just like with the origins of of humans the the this research is really exciting and it's going on all the time so stay tuned folks um yeah as I say there's a lot of um a lot of genetic analysis uh, ongoing a lot of stuff um going on at the moment uh so and of course what's happening is honeybee populations are being hybridized which makes it slightly more complicated again and that's just happening it's happening for various reasons partly for humans just partly naturally as well um so let's see the m lineage 
is believed to have come from Spain and uh, Portugal, from Iberia, up here, up here, and across eastwards, north of these mountains, because it's hard for it to cross these mountains, it's not adapted to high mountains, um, to as far as the Urals, and of course, across what is now the English Channel, but was a land bridge, and across the Irish Sea, which now the Irish Sea was a land bridge, because this whole continental shelf, including Doggerland here, um, the, 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 the North Sea, Dogger Bank was uh, above the water level the, and, um, as the ice as the ice melted this water has lifted and, and then cut off these, these populations here and so that's that's how it's understood to her to have dispersed um, as I said so you've got the M and the C lineages separate because the, the Alps are in the way essentially um, and they've evolved differently because of different because different conditions just as I was talking about natural selection subspecies apis mellifera mellifera was um as dispersed and that, of course what the last glass glaciation about ten thousand years ago um the as the ice receded the bees went north because they could survive and they migrated north uh, as, as suddenly the plants the plants grew up in those places um and then of course as, as, as it says here, the isolation of Britain and Ireland as the land bridge ceased to be meant that those populations then were adapting and were not being mixed in with other populations coming north or coming from the east. And so they they adapted to the local climates. And that's why we have AMM in Ireland and Britain now as uh, being somewhat different. So how are they different well um they said to they said to need less resources so more frugal is the typical way it's described uh less less brood product less production uh, less brood rearing is synchronized with foraging and drones of course are kicked out in late autumn psychological it's physiological changes the winter bee i think you know uh, uh, stores fat and so on and so forth uh, a, a larger rectum so they don't have to go out as often in horrible weather in the winter and they can fly under cooler and wetter conditions and they can mate uh, um, under, under wetter conditions as well. There's some evidence of that. And their body structure, relatively long, certainly compared to the Italian bee, Lugustica, um, larger body and therefore, and longer hairs. And of course, the bigger you are and the hairier you are, the easier it is to keep warm as a balding man, I can say that with some confidence. Um, and so you can see how these adaptations help the bee to the AMM to survive in the in the de wet damp conditions of Northwest Europe. Um, and so now I'm going to show you look at a genetic analysis which showed a high percentage of pure AMM in Ireland. This is quite a complicated slide. So what I would encourage you to do is to uh, listen, listen to this, 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 maybe watch this slide a couple of times, and better still, go and get the data. If you, the data, the, the paper is open access, and as you can see here is the name of it, a significant pure population of the dark European honeybees, AMM, remains in Ireland, and it's under, it's in the JAR, Journal of Apicultural Research. So if you read the whole paper, you'll get a lot more information, because I, this is a, this is a challenging slide. So the first thing, uh, just following the text down here, the first thing is we're, we're going to look at um, computer modeling where we assume there are two populations, four populations and five populations. And when we say there are two, we can see differentiation between the M lineage, which is the green. You'll remember M is Apis mellifera, uh, mellifera mellifera, um, and, uh, and, and Iberica as well, if it's there. And the C lineage, the Carnicus and the Carnica and Lugustica, which is there. And when and looking at those, as you would expect, there's a fairly clear distinction because they're separate populations. There's a little bit of the green creeping into the red, and there's a little bit of red creeping into the green. I should explain that each vertical line is one B that's been sequenced, that's been analyzed. And what you can see here is one B here that is uh, 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 a M, uh, which is a C lineage, but actually. There are a few bees here that have quite a lot of, of M lineage in them for one reason or another. Maybe they're in a border population or something. You see there. And you can also see here in the green, in the M lineage, you can see some other populations here. And I understand anecdotally that those are buckfast. And you, you know there are some buckfast bees in Ireland. So that wouldn't be 
it wouldn't be unusual in a way that kind of validates it to say, well, yes, you, it would be unrealistic to expect purity there. So looking at the next picture, this is where we model and we say there are four different populations. Um, and what you can see here is the Ligustica, the Italian bees, are pretty much pure Italian. There's not much, a little bit of, of others in there. The, the Carnica, the red, this time red means Carnica. Um, uh, it doesn't mean the lineage, it means a particular subspecies. And you can see here there is some green, which is Irish mellifera, and some blue, which is European mellifera, creeping in here. But again, relatively pure population. These are the reference populations. The European mellifera um, has quite a lot in common with the Irish mellifera. And the Irish mellifera is pretty pure here, as you can see. These are bees, this is, these are bee samples from Ireland. And the, the study will show you, those are, you know, they're taken from all over Ireland. Um, um, and so on. Now, of course, how you sample, and you, you know this in surveys about politicians, uh, surveying humans now, um, how you do the sampling depends, it, it dictates how you, where you get the answer. So one of the things that would be good is if another study was done asking, uh, doing sampling in a different way and so on and so forth. And um, other so it's a single study. Um, but nevertheless, it's really interesting results. And it'll be really interesting to see if other studies su um, support it or dig into it in more detail. In particular, I think when I look at the next slide, the next uh, picture here. So this time the model is looking at seeing five different different um, different populations. Again, these, these are the same, but what we can see here, there's a specific subset of the Irish manipula population that has, that is different. Is really interesting and it definitely prompts extra research. Um, um, really very, very, very inter interesting uh, findings altogether. Um, so the Rutner study showed that introduction of Apis, Apis mellifera subspecies from other locations may lead to a lower survival rate. It's fairly logical if you bring bees that expect a wet, a wet cold winter and you put them in Italy, they may not do very well. Um, it may lead to lower survival rate, hybridization, because they will mate, clearly bees mate on the wing, um, and you can't stop them um, mating with other subspecies if they're present. And introgression, where the, where the, where the genes get mixed. Um, and so um, this, the Rutner study, it is not based on Irish data, but it is based on European data. And it, it kind of is very logical as well. And you see this in other, other uh, creatures as well. As well. So, and so, and so, therefore, what you see is hybridization leads to introgression, a loss of biological diversity, because the, the things that make the bee different are lost as it gets more hybridized. Which means the genetic material, the, the stuff that makes the bee successful in that climate, gets lost in their environment. Um, and therefore they're less able to survive. And that's important. Now, climate change is a whole other conversation, which we're not gonna have here and now, but these are the principles. And this is the principles on, on which therefore it is, it, is, it is logical that we should, that we should seek to, to preserve AMM. Just a note on the Irish um, landscape, the agricultural, the, the uh, plants out there. Uh, both agricultural and wild crops, there is a lot of plants from early spring to late autumn, um, which uh, uh, for the bees. And of course, it benefits the primary producers because they get high yield because of better pollination, and it benefits the bees as well because they thrive. So everybody wins. There is a conversation to be had about other types of bee and the impact of uh, on other types of other pollinators of honeybees, but that's not for this place. So if you like the summary, the bees in Ireland are a result of evolution and the develop, de development of morphological and behavioral traits, so how they look and how they are, how they behave, to survive. And of course, interference by beekeepers. I mean, we've, we know that the Roman army brought their bees with them. The Normans brought bees. There's the legend, there are two bee, two Irish saints who, um, who are patron saints of bees, of course, the St. Ambrose. There's also St. Modern Knock. Um, and Modern Knock was a disciple of St. David of Wales, of course, who lived in, in West Wales. And, 
uh, when Madame Nock was heading back to Ireland, he was a beekeeper. And when he, his bees, uh, Madame Nock's bees, saw him leaving and swarmed, as so the legend goes, onto his boat and to want to go to Ireland. And he, 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 he so he turned his boat around and gave him, brought the bees back to St. David and said, you know, these are your bees, they don't want them following me. And he set out again and they followed him again. And so the story goes. Uh, it's a legend, but the point is the bees are moved by humans, uh, sometimes consciously and occasionally swarms just uh, arrive in places. And that just happens. But the impact is the impact of bees from other locations may be at the cost of, of colony survival. And cons conservation of genetic diversity is important anyway. So what can we do about it? Well, we should be aware of the importance to breed, of breeding from locally adapted honeybee stocks, locally adapted honeybee stocks. So you're rearing queens, but you're also rearing drones. If you can produce it, so don't, don't, you know, drone trapping is a good way of, um, of, of controlling varroa, but removing your drones from the local ecosystem is a bad thing to do in general, because you're getting more inbreeding, more hybridization. And obviously big strong colonies are in everybody's interest. I don't think I need to explain that to you. Yeah. Okay. Here uh, is the final slide. If we are, um, if we are measure, looking after our bees properly, one of the things to do is to have a more detailed hive record card so that we can actually measure properly what's going on with our bees rather than simply the day to day. I'm not going to take you through this in, in any detail because having a hive record card is something you'll all be familiar with um, and you'll know the importance of measuring different criteria, not just for making remembering when you did your varroa treatment, but and, and but also understanding more about the bees themselves. So that concludes our lecture. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you found it interesting.